I'm uh, Dr. Richard Scott. I'm one of the founding partners here at RMA New Jersey, and I'm also the uh, clinical and scientific director. I grew up all over the country. Uh, my father was a test pilot, and we lived everywhere from Hawaii to Rhode Island, to California to Virginia to Georgia. Um, my mother was a teacher, and I think those two ethoses really influenced me as much as anything else in my life the commitment to serve, the, the obligation to try to provide a greater society and to help people in general, as well as a strong commitment to education have driven most of the uh, things that have led me to make decisions in my professional life. I left high school after my sophomore year and went to college um, without financial support for my family. And so I worked my way through school and uh, went through undergraduate school in about three years and then really didn't have the means to, to go to medical school. So my involvement with the United States Air Force was in the form of a scholarship program which entitled young people to be able to go to medical school that otherwise did not have the financial resources to do so. So they sponsored me through school to University of Virginia. Uh, then I went and did a residency in San Antonio, Texas um, and had excellent training, was very fortunate. I spent some time paying back my obligation that I got for all of the support that they had provided. Uh, four years in San Antonio and two in Bethesda, Maryland working with the Federal Fellowship at the NIH. It was a magical time uh, to be at the Jones Institute in the 1980s when we were learning so much and things were changing so rapidly. And to be able to study uh, next to Georgiana Jones and listen not only to the technical factual details, but the insightful part of how to care for patients, how to, how to, how to really do translational research while providing outstanding clinical care uh, was a privilege that may be the greatest of my career. When I have spare time, I fly airplanes. Uh, my dad was a test pilot. I've been around airplanes my whole life. Um, and I have flown just about every kind of airplane you can imagine. I have 12 different ratings from the FAA. So uh, I always joke that if you can start it, I can fly it. Uh, because some of the checklists to get them started are from foreign planes in foreign countries, and I can't read the doggone checklist. But um, it's really a lot of fun, and I've flown all kinds of airplanes. My family is unusual in that uh, I married my high school sweetheart. We had kids when we were relatively young while I was in medical school. Um, and so I have, my oldest daughter is 31 and my youngest daughter is 11. And so I know what it's like to be a very young parent of modest means. Uh, I know what it's like to have to work hard to build a career while you're building a family. And I also know what it's like to have a, a child when you're a little bit older, you're a little more mature, a little more established, but maybe not quite as energetic as you were when you were 23. And so I've experienced the full gamut of that, and I think it helps me relate to patients in all phases of life. I have uh, 31, 29, 19, and 11 year olds, so I've seen just about everything within the spectrum. One of the common questions we get today is why do we culture all of the embryos in our RVF patients to the blastocyst stage? And the reason isn't just about the embryo. The reality is, is that a, a young lady's uterus, her endometrium, is only receptive about two days out of each month. And embryos can only be ready to implant for a matter of a few hours. As it turns out, particularly as people get a little further through their reproductive life, that alignment goes away. Sometime this embryo, which is perfectly capable of making a healthy baby, simply won't implant because it got ready too late. If you transfer on day three, if you transfer earlier than day three, you can't tell. There is no way to predict, not only if the embryo blastulates, but will it blastulate at the correct time? For that reason, we really no longer feel uh, comfortable transferring on day three, at, at least at outstanding centers, it's no longer within the standard of care. The single most important reason that leads an embryo to fail to become a baby is genetic abnormality. It's just extremely common in human beings. And because of that, uh, clinicians and scientists have for decades been trying to find a way to provide accurate genetic diagnosis of an embryo prior to allowing the patient to conceive through IVF. The early technologies such as FISH and CGH were failures. Uh, but more recently, qPCR-based technologies and or SNP-based microarrays provide something called comprehensive chromosomal screening or CCS and those have been highly validated and are extraordinarily effective. It's the application of those technologies that allows us to truly gain insight into the reproductive potential of a single embryo. That allows you to put just one back at a time. And of course, that provides extremely high pregnancy rates, very low loss rates, and good outcomes while completely avoiding multiple gestation. The late 1990s was an interesting time in reproductive medicine because new technologies were coming available that offered us great opportunity to provide better care. But at the same time, there was no grant funding. 
and there were no resources available within universities or, or large private hospital systems to really integrate all these new technologies and really raise the standard of care. And because of that, uh, Dr. Paul Berg and Dr. Michael Drews and myself decided that we needed to try to build something different, something special. And so we built a practice that was designed to provide the very highest level of patient care. But we also take seriously our commitment to education. Uh, we train fellows here, uh, but at the same time, we travel all over the world teaching people about the kinds of research that we do here. Uh, within that context, we also do um, a great deal of education of basic scientists and embryologists from programs all over the country and all over the world. We work closely with industry. And so we had a vision of trying to build a program that would provide great clinical care, would be uh, translational in terms of being able to bring new technologies and new research into the field for the very first time anywhere in the world, and to try to do all of that to provide patient-friendly focused care at a standard which is unavailable anywhere else in the world. To have a great program uh, that provides great clinical care, you have to have talent at every position. Right. So having good physicians with outstanding training and who are in fact thought leaders within the world as at the foundation. But we also have great nurses who are highly focused and are respected throughout the country for the quality of care and their insights into this process. We have an excellent administrative team who's here every morning at 5.30 to make sure that our patients can get in and out of here and get back to their regular jobs or onto their daily responsibilities. We have a financial team that is recognized uh, and lectures about how to help patients through this process all over the country annually. Uh, and so we have talent at every position. We're focused on the patient. Our goal is to get the patient through the process as simply and as quickly as possible to attain the outcome, which is the healthy birth of a singleton pregnancy.